So this video's existence may come off as a bit of a surprise to some of you. Heck, in a way, it's kind of a surprise to me too. I don't usually do Games of the Year videos, mostly because I don't tend to play many of a year's games in the year they came out. And even when I do, I often just start playing them, only to put them down and let them get lost in my way too big backlog pile. And for most of 2021, that was the same case. Most of the games I played last year were either ones I've played before, or older ones I was playing for the first time. For instance, would you believe me if I said I played Minecraft for the very first time last year? Despite this, there were a fair few new games I got the chance to play over the course of the year, enough so that I felt I could justify making a list like this. And that's not to say I felt like this past year was significantly stronger for games than previous ones, there's just some games I'd like to take the opportunity to talk about that I may not otherwise in video form, so I felt this was a fine solution. Now of course, I'm only one person with only so much time and money, so I didn't get a chance to play every 2021 game I wanted to try. So because of that, don't be surprised if some of 2021's bigger releases don't show up here. With all that said and done, I present to you my top 10 favorite games of 2021. So let's start things off simple with a pretty accessible genre, the 3D platformer. It may not be as active of a genre in the AAA scene as it once was, but the same cannot be said about them in the indie scene. Heck, the very existence of Hub World, a Nintendo Direct style show from last year that showcased a ton of indie 3D platformers, proves that this genre is actually quite active. And it was through Hub World that I was first introduced to Tori 3D and its then newly announced sequel, Tori 2. The simplistic mechanics and low poly visuals gave me a serious classic PS1 vibe. And while they fell off my radar for a little bit, I did end up getting both of them and, well, they're on this list for a reason. And yes, I'm putting both games on the list. As I noted, both games are quite simple 3D platformers, with not much in regards to what the titular Tori can do. But both games get the most out of this with some pretty solid level design, and in the case of Tori 2, some very fun level gimmicks, such as these lasers and rings that send Tori launching at high speeds. And all this comes with that classic PS1 era aesthetic, comprised in a way that makes for a pleasant visual style that, while looking old, doesn't feel aged. Though, don't let the vibrant colors and cutesy characters fool you. These games have a few creepy tricks up their sleeves. More so in the first game than the second one, but believe me, you'll be surprised how much you start panic running through some of the levels. I will never trust Golden Stars with faces ever again. Now granted, both these games are very short, with both of them being able to be beaten in less than an hour, but hey, with both games only costing a single dollar each, they're certainly worth giving a go. Seriously, that's their default prices on the Switch eShop. I get they're really short games, but this still feels like robbery for how good they are. With the introduction of various elements currently in the gaming industry, such as indie games and digital storefronts, it feels like we've been getting a ton more games coming out on a yearly basis compared to previous generations. Because of that, every year, some great games get released that can easily fly under the radar. This next game, for instance, came out in March, but I didn't even know it existed until the start of December, when I saw a friend of mine tweet about them getting it. And after doing a little bit of research on it, I very quickly followed. And that game is none other than Everhood, an ineffable tale of the inexpressible divine moments of truth. Or just Everhood. Now yes, this game has been lucky enough to get itself a small following, but nothing more beyond that. Though with how explosive and out of control fandoms can get once large enough, that may not necessarily be a bad thing. But anyway, this here's a bit of an interesting title. On a surface level, this could be seen as just an Undertale clone, and admittedly, in some ways it is, but in other ways, it almost feels like a response to Undertale and the kind of themes it tackled, taking those themes and doing its own spin on it. It's really hard to describe what I mean without going into spoiler territory, but if you do play this game, you'll see what I mean. The game has you controlling this Geno palette swap on a quest to retrieve one of your arms, which has been stolen. And along the way, you meet plenty of quirky and charming characters. They're all relatively straightforward characters, but many of them are still quite likable regardless. With personal special mention going to the mischievous Green Mage, who is just the best character. Now while there are a fair number of similarities to Undertale with the visual style and themes and writing, where Everhood really shines is its combat. While Undertale goes for a turn-based RPG format, Everhood here instead makes battles more like, of all things, Guitar Hero. The enemy will send out projectiles like rhythm game notes, and you've got to avoid them. It's a pretty unique system for a game like this, and quite a fun one to overcome in the various encounters. Plus, later on in the game, you get the ability to attack by grabbing projectiles of the same colors and deflecting them back, adding another layer to the battles. Everhood's battle system is easily my favorite aspect of the game. I don't think I ever got tired of partaking in fights whenever they came up. And given the rhythmic element of the battles, you can bet that the game's got itself a great soundtrack. Which yes, it does. Especially in the case of the unique battle themes. 
Some of my favorites include the theme of your last fight with the Green Mage, and the final boss theme for one of the game's alternate ending routes, which is what's currently playing. Now while all of this is solid, what keeps it from getting any higher is... the story. It's all well and good during the first half of the game, but once you hit the halfway point, the game gives you a new objective. And while I won't spoil what exactly the story asks of you or where it goes, I'll just say I... wasn't really a fan of its choice of direction. And given how much the game this part of the story takes up, it did bring the experience a bit down for me. Also, I know I had an epilepsy warning at the start, but even as someone who's not epileptic, this game gets a little too nuts with its visual intensity at points. That said, despite these issues, I did still enjoy my time with Everhood overall, and my gripes for the second half of the story could just be a me thing. So hey, don't let that deter you from giving it a try if you're interested. Also, there's a kart racing minigame at one point, and it's like, actually really well made. I cannot escape this genre for the life of me, somebody send help. While well, on the topic of racing games... Given how into racing games I was growing up, particularly kart racers, I in turn had myself a bit of a racing phase as a kid. And because of that, I ended up with a lot of toy cars throughout my childhood. More specifically, Hot Wheels toy cars. I only owned a couple of the full sets, but I was more than happy with one of those road-heavy town mats. Any of you remember those? On the flip side, I owned a ton of Hot Wheels cars, and I played with them a lot, about as much as LEGO to be honest. So of course, with this nostalgic connection to the Hot Wheels brand, you can bet that the announcement of a brand new Hot Wheels video game immediately caught my attention. Hot Wheels has had a fair few games in the past, but it had been a while since the last one for consoles, and this new one was looking good. And that was before they revealed stuff like the inclusion of iconic cars from various other franchises, or the Track Creator. That last detail especially sold me on this game. And, well, it being on this list should tell you how I felt about it. Now that's not to say everything about it is perfect. I do think the drifting system is a bit finicky, with it working perfectly sometimes and not so much other times. And while there's no microtransactions currently, there is DLC but no MTX, the existence of the live service season system and loot boxes to unlock cars do make me worry that the game could end up going that route. Currently, you can only buy loot boxes with in-game money, but as we've learned in the past, that can easily be changed. Hoping it doesn't though. But beyond those, Hot Wheels Unleashed is a pretty solid racing game. The first thing I really like about this game is its choice of visual style. While previous Hot Wheels games have had you race in actual cars, this one commits to the concept of Hot Wheels cars being toys. As such, the cars you drive are modeled to look like their toy counterparts, all the tracks are set in ordinary locations, and the tracks themselves are made of those classic Hot Wheels track pieces. Sure, these tracks will have you define gravity in ways you could not do with them in real life, but the commitment to this theme adds a really fun charm to the experience. And to also commit to this theming, most if not all of the game's cars are based off actual Hot Wheels toys. Heck, I even remember owning some of these. This toilet car in particular I distinctly remember having, though I don't believe mine was blue. Also, one of the DLC cars is the Diora 2, the car used by Vert Wheeler in the Hot Wheels World Race animated movie. And as someone who watched World Race multiple times as a kid, I was very happy to see this. Though, it was pushed to the wayside once I unlocked the DeLorean. Sorry other cars, but my Back to the Future bias triumphs overall. And that's all before mentioning the Track Creator. According to the developers, the Track Creator given to players was the same one they used to build the game's official tracks. So you have a lot of creative freedom with what you can do with these. I think this addition was a great call, both to be on brand with the nature of the Hot Wheels track sets, and because track creators are just a really cool feature to have. Though of course, none of this would be as effective without strong gameplay, which, finicky drifting aside, Hot Wheels Unleashed definitely has. It's incredibly fun arcade racing goodness. And while not my favorite of the genre to come out of 2021, we'll get to that later, I'm definitely satisfied with what I got here. So it would now be a bad time to admit that I've played very few games in the Mario Party series. I got onto the Mario Party train a bit later than most, with Mario Party 7 being my first one, so that left me with 8 and DS before the series took a nosedive. And with the prices the older Mario Party games went for, I wasn't going to be able to experience those other games anytime soon. And sure, Super Mario Party was alright, but it didn't quite scratch the itch. Because of that, the reveal of Mario Party Superstars and Nintendo's E3 Direct definitely caught my interest. Remastered boards from the N64 games, and minigames from across all the numbered titles, and online play right from launch? This was my chance to at least get a taste of what I'd been missing out on, and with more than just my local friends no less. And man was I not disappointed. I don't even think I need to explain in detail how gameplay works in Mario Party. You roll your dice, you move your... Mario, and somebody usually gets hurt. 
also there's minigames. I'm sure you all know how classic Mario Party gameplay plays out, and this is certainly classic. Sure, there's not many boards, only having five across the N64 trilogy, which I know has been a point of criticism from many, but given my situation with the series, I am still happy with what we got. Horror Land's probably my favorite of the ones we got, though that also could be because of my first time on it, which was on my buddy Quarter Guy's stream. I was about to roll for the star, except I just realized I am one coin short. No, I will be using this. Okay. Well then. Well? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> that does not help at all! <laughs> Indeed does it does not, not help! help. At all. But of course, Mario Party ain't Mario Party without the minigames. And man do they pick some good ones. And also Tug of War. Admittedly, I'm a bit disappointed by the lackluster choices from Seven, but at the same time, getting to experience these older classics for the first time makes up for it. I finally got to play the legendary Book Squirm after all these years. I don't know, it's kind of hard to really go deep into this one. It's Old School Mario Party, done really well. Now, I haven't played many traditional Battle Royale games. Only one, actually. And while this trend has gotten tiresome, I will at least say that there's one type of Battle Royale game that I've grown to like. Not sure if there's an official name for this, but the type that latches the Battle Royale formula onto an already existing classic game. As in, stuff like Tetris 99 and Super Mario Bros. 35. Now granted, I am trash at Tetris 99, but Mario 35 I had a lot of fun with. Reimagining Mario 1 in a way that allows for players to compete and send enemies and hazards to other players made for a fun spin on this formula. Sadly though, for some reason, Nintendo pulled the plug on Mario 35 at the end of March. A decision I still don't entirely understand. But as unfortunate as that was, at the very least, we got a good alternative soon after. While I may be trash at Tetris, I'm actually semi-decent at Pac-Man, so right from the get-go, I had a feeling I was going to end up enjoying Pac-Man 99. And enjoy it, I have. Now, they could have easily just thrown people in the classic Pac-Man and have you attack players by eating the four usual ghosts, but those geniuses at Arika decided to go one step further, throwing in features from the best Pac-Man game, Pac-Man Championship Edition. So now you're not just sending the main four, you're able to call upon ghost trains and gobble up several ghosts at once, sending a whole bunch of jammer Pac-Man to slow your opponents down, or kill them outright once the red jammers come out to play. That combined with Championship Edition's speed-up mechanics make this a frantic game of survival, but one that's more adrenaline pumping than anxiety inducing. And I think the remixed compositions really help with that, especially in the case of when you get to the top 10. While Tetris 99's top 10 music gets you into a state of panic that might get you to make easy mistakes, Pac-Man 99's top 10 music is a motivator, pushing you to give it your all. Seriously, I love this game's soundtrack. And hey, not feeling like looking at classic Pac-Man all the time? Like with Tetris 99, the game's got itself alternate skins for the amazing characters, many of which being based on other Namco games. I tend to find myself using this theme from Tower of Draga, one of my personal favorite Namco arcade games. But yeah, Pac-Man 99's a really exciting game and definitely worth trying if you've got Switch Online. And unlike Mario 35, this one doesn't seem like it's going to be going back into the Disney vault anytime soon. It's funny, for as much as I really enjoyed Undertale, which I played not long after it came out, I never got around to trying out its follow-up game, Deltarune, when the first chapter of it got released a few years ago. And it was free, I really didn't have an excuse. Either way, I finally did give chapter 1 a go not too long ago. And yeah, I liked it. Admittedly though, I could definitely tell this was indeed a first chapter, as there was a lot of time spent setting everything up that'll likely come into play as future chapters come out. And just when I was starting to feel invested in what was going on, the game was already wrapping up. If I had played chapter 1 when it first came out, I'm honestly not sure if I would have felt the desire to keep up with future chapters. Lucky me though, that by the time I got around to it, the game's second chapter was already out, so I was able to jump right into it afterwards. And I'm definitely glad I waited, because chapter 2 was MUCH better. For starters, while both chapters do play similarly to their predecessor Undertale, with being able to use enemy specific actions to get them to a state that you can spare them instead of fighting them, I actually kind of prefer the way Deltarune does things. I like having multiple party members, and the opportunity to strategize who will do what in each situation as a result. And the inclusion of the TP system that encourages riskier movement when avoiding enemy attacks was great as well. But in regards to everything else, Chapter 2 builds upon Chapter 1 in so many ways. For one, while Chapter 1's Dark World was good for what it needed to be, Chapter 2's Cyber World is much better, with a large variety of unique and kind of bonkers set pieces and puzzles, along with being an aesthetically interesting locale as a whole. On top of that, the writing in Chapter 2 is fantastic. Not to knock on Chapter 1's writing, it's still solid, but 
with it being the first chapter, it was kind of bound to having to do a lot of setup, which for a chapter as short as it is, does result in some limitations. Chapter 2, on the other hand, doesn't have those same limitations, allowing for the writing to go a lot wilder, which it certainly does. Whether it be from the interactions between the main party members, with Ralsei being my personal favorite of the team, or the contributions from the new major characters, Chapter 2's writing is great at capturing whatever tone it was aiming for, whether that be heartfelt, unsettling, or utterly hilarious. I genuinely lost count of how many times I burst out laughing during my playthrough, and most of these cases came from the best new character, Queen. Queen is genuinely one of the funniest characters I've ever seen in a game, and her antics really helped carry the already strong writing. And all of this is on top of what you come to expect from Toby Fox's games. Beautiful pixel art and phenomenal music. Though this time, instead of composing it all himself, Toby enlisted the help of Marcy Nabors of Homestuck fame and Lena Rain, the composer of Celeste. With a trio like that, it's no wonder so many of Chapter 2's songs slap as hard as they do, with special mention going to A Cyber's World, Pandora Palace, Attack of the Killer Queen, and my new favorite boss theme in the Undertale universe, Big Shot. There's more I'd love to say about Deltarune Chapter 2, but I don't want to spoil it for anyone who may not have gotten around to it yet. All in all, I am really happy I finally sat myself down and played through what we have of Deltarune currently. The only downside, though, is that now I too have to eagerly wait for the remaining chapters. Looking forward to seeing the next set of chapters in 2024. Some of you may remember that midway through last year, I put out a reaction video for Nintendo's E3 Direct. It was a really solid Direct, with a lot of notable releases getting their first look, including a game that's already shown up on this list. Of course, the biggest deals of the event were easily the Metroid Dread reveal and the Breath of the Wild 2 gameplay trailer, but anyone who's seen that video knows that, for me at least, something else from the show stood out. What we got here? Yes! Yes! It's finally coming to Switch! Oh, I wasn't expecting this, but I'm so happy. Oh, new cruising game. I knew this was in arcades. I never thought I would actually get a console port. Oh, that makes me happy. That makes me happy. I know I'm largely a kart racer guy, but I do love me some more traditional arcade racers as well, as evidenced by Hot Wheels Unleashed being on the list earlier. And easily one of my favorites of that genre is the Cruisin' series. I know they're among some of the more janky games on the scene, but if that ain't part of the charm of them. I've played a ton of Cruisin' USA on N64 throughout my life, and while I didn't own their console ports, I have gotten chances to play both Cruisin' World and Cruisin' Exotica in arcades, and they're great fun too. Because of that, the announcement of Cruisin' Blast back in 2016 was super exciting to hear about. Though shortly after its 2017 launch in arcades, it had been stated that the game was likely going to remain arcade exclusive. So the sudden reveal of the Switch version at E3 caught me completely off guard. Now yes, this is a console port of a 2017 arcade game, but they also add a ton of new features and content to this version, so I'm willing to count the Switch version as a 2021 game. Plus, there was no way I was going to do a Games of 2021 video without talking about this because WOW! I don't know how clear I've made it in the past, but I'm a big fan of games that are, well, kind of stupid in how insane they get. So a 90s style arcade racer with cars that do somersaults and wheelies, while racing on top of London trains as a Ferris wheel rolls out of control throughout the city, this is right up my alley. Granted, the single player content is a bit lacking, and it does have some performance issues when it comes to split screen. This game ain't absolutely perfect, I'll admit. But Cruisin' Blast is just so utterly ridiculous that I can't help but love it. What other arcade racer lets you drift and do front flips as a helicopter, or race along real cars as a levitating hammerhead shark with a laser mounted on its head? The only thing that I think would have made the experience better, aside from the aforementioned issues, is the addition of online play. As of now, it's strictly local play. But that said, I had... Well, a blast with Cruisin' Blast. And apparently the developers are now considering remastering the original Cruisin' Trilogy as well? I am 100% down for that. And literally the day before I recorded for this video, it was brought to my attention that they're planning on adding online multiplayer and DLC? Jeez Louise Rothrills, you're spoiling us! I've made it no secret in the past that hyper-realistic visuals don't really do it for me. Not that I can't appreciate a game that's aiming to look realistic, many of them do look amazing, but there comes a point where the needless amount of detail starts to feel a bit trivial. I personally prefer when a game tries something a bit different, whether it's replicating the look of a hand-drawn animated film, or being made entirely through scans of clay models, or, as I saw one review of the game Solar Ash put it, an aesthetic that resembles the cover of an old sci-fi novel. The vibrant art style was the first thing that caught my interest in Solar Ash, when I first saw it at the PS5 reveal event in 2020, and the gameplay that accompanied it did look quite interesting. And while it fell off my radar a few times over the course of last year, I did end up getting and playing it right at launch. And admittedly, 
it took a bit for me to really like this one. Don't get me wrong, I was liking it from Square One, but something about the gameplay and story weren't quite clicking with me initially, despite the interesting concepts and premise. And I'm not entirely sure what it was, but about halfway through, something finally did click, and I found myself really enjoying what Solar Ash had to offer. The game has you playing as Ray, one of many Void Runners sent into a massive black hole known as the Ultra Void, to try and seal it before it can destroy the Void Runner's home planet. Along the way, you explore the remains of other worlds previously consumed by the Ultra Void, with a small handful of delusional survivors left to interact with and partake in side quests for. The story does put a large emphasis on the backstory and lore, requiring you to find data logs from your fellow Void Runners and ask questions to your AI companion Sid, also known as the best character in the game, to get most of the pieces of the story's puzzle. We do clearly remember how pleased he was to see us back online. He called us a Fire Cup, which seems odd as we lack the ability to hold or contain dairy. And while it takes its time to get interesting, when those pieces start coming together closer to the end, the direction it goes gets really interesting. As for the gameplay, it has you exploring the many areas within the Ultra Void, with a large emphasis on traversal. And sure enough, hover skating across the vibrantly colored clouds, and climbing and rail grinding and grapple hooking through the remains of these alien planets is really fun to do. The game does have combat, but with how simplistic it is and with the minimal enemy variety, it's quite clear that the exploration and platforming are the larger focus, along with taking out these things known as anomalies. These sequences have you hitting specific nerve points within an allotted time to destroy the anomaly. And once every anomaly in an area is destroyed, you get to take on that area's very Shadow the Colossus inspired boss. Admittedly, the process of fighting the anomalies and bosses can get frustrating after numerous failed attempts, as the windows for failure get ridiculously small closer to the end, but they still made for satisfying foes to take down. And all this is accompanied with the previously mentioned sci-fi novel cover-esque aesthetic, which makes for some utterly gorgeous environments all throughout. Even in those more frustrating moments of gameplay, I can still look out to the horizon and just appreciate how beautiful these ruined worlds are. And this all leads to what I felt was an incredible ending. I won't spoil it here, nor could I really explain it without taking up a bunch more time to explain everything else, but it left me shocked, surprised, and very satisfied. Now I can't personally say how Solar Ash compares to the developer's previous game, the acclaimed Hyperlight Drifter, since I haven't played it myself, but while it took its time to hook me, I ended up thoroughly enjoying Solar Ash, and would definitely recommend giving it a try if you own a PS4 or PS5, or are willing to use the Epic Game Store. Getting into a long-running series via the newest entry tends to be an interesting experience. Some franchises are better suited to this than others, like no one's going to tell you that you need to play through the Mario Kart games chronologically before you can play Mario Kart 8, but it can provide a unique perspective for said player compared to its long-running fanbase. Last year, I went through such a process, as in every way other than literal, Ratchet & Clank Rift Apart was my first Ratchet & Clank game. Granted, I do know a lot about the series and its story and characters, thanks to friends, but before 2021, I had only technically experienced two Ratchet & Clank games. I had played five minutes at most of a demo for Tools of Destruction at a game store when it was coming out, and while I did own the movie tie-in game on PS4, it was one of those cases where I ended up dropping it early on and never picking it back up. I think I only got, like, a couple hours in, so I hardly count those experiences as playing the series. Having said that, the reveal of Rift Apart in 2020 did have my interest, so despite my minimal experience with the series, I did end up getting it right at launch. Now I can't say I know what the general consensus to Rift Apart currently is among fans. I recall seeing mostly positive reception initially, but you all know how fandoms can be about new releases after that launch hype dies down. But for me personally, as someone with almost no experience playing these games, I loved it. For one, while it has itself a pretty straightforward, resistance fighting against a tyrannical ruler plotline, I did find myself invested in the story and characters. And one thing that the game does do pretty smartly is give you all the context you need for certain story beats, in case this is your first time experiencing Ratchet & Clank at all. In my case, the knowledge I already had about the previous game's stories did help me understand things more, such as the nature of the Dimensionator and Ratchet's whole personal quest, but it never felt like I wouldn't be able to enjoy the story if I didn't know these things. The most I'd miss are some specific callbacks to previous events. And while not quite as hilarious as some other games on this list, I did find myself entertained pretty constantly by the writing, with Dr. Nefarious being a particular highlight, which seems to be the case in the games he shows up in from what I gather. 
As for the gameplay, I definitely found myself far more engaged than I thought I'd be. As I've previously stated, I'm more of a hack and slash guy than a run and gun guy. But it didn't take long for me to really get into Rift Apart's combat, especially as I both upgraded my weapons and unlocked new ones. Fight sequences were constantly fun to partake in, going to town on enemies while maneuvering around their own attacks. I'm aware this has been the series standard for a while, but I can definitely see why. And that's on top of the game's other gameplay elements, whether it be exploring and platforming, or boosting around with the hover boots, or going through these logic puzzles, or the various crazy scripted sequences. And that's all before mentioning the most impressive aspect of the game. One of the big selling points of Rift Apart was showcasing how powerful the PS5's hardware is, specifically with how quickly full environments can be loaded. The trailers definitely made that apparent with these large set-piece moments of dimensional jumping, but this moment here was where it really clicked for me. I was able to toggle between two completely different areas, literally with only a second of loading. I was utterly blown away. And the best part is that the game doesn't even restrain itself to feel like an overpriced tech demo, because even beyond the amazing showcase of the PS5's capabilities, the game is incredibly fun and exciting all throughout. Again, I don't know if this is the common opinion among longtime Ratchet and Clank fans, but as an outsider now stepping in, I had a wonderful time with Rift Apart, and now that I've gotten a full taste of what these games are like, my interest in the series has only grown. I just wish there was an easier way to experience these games without a PS3. So at the start of the video, I noted that the main drive behind doing all this was so I could talk about games that I may not otherwise have a chance to focus on in video form. I don't tend to do reviews on newer games, and even when I do, there's usually a specific reason for me doing so. The reason I bring this all up is because, funny enough, my number one is actually an exception to both of these cases, as I've not only talked about this game in videos this past year, but one of those videos was a full review on it and it alone. I imagine many of you know exactly where I'm going with this now, so with that said, Let's once again talk about Kaze and the Wild Masks. The funny thing is, I didn't even have this as my number one initially when I began early work on this video. But as I reflected on everything I had played over the course of 2021, and especially after replaying it for the sake of getting footage for this video, I knew I had to put this at the top. And I'll fully admit that a lot of this choice is very much a me thing. I doubt you're going to see this at number one on anyone else's Games of 2021 list. But hey, that's what you get for choosing to watch my take on the topic. As someone who grew up with a lot of exposure to the Super Nintendo, Kaze and the Wild Masks scratches a very nostalgic itch for me, especially so with it being heavily inspired by the Donkey Kong Country games, easily my favorite series of games from that era. Now yes, this game does wear the inspiration very clearly on its sleeves, and with absolutely no shame in doing so, but the way it utilizes that base formula still allows it to shine as its own experience. Also helps that the Kong they chose to base Kaze's moveset off of is the Kong I enjoy playing as the most in the DKC trilogy, so I'm absolutely not complaining even when it throws in animal transformations to change up the gameplay, it all remains consistently solid and keeps to its core, while still allowing for some variety with these new means of maneuvering. Kaze and the Wild Masks is a game that knows where its strengths lie and holds onto them at all times, allowing for a wonderfully polished adventure that feel right at home among the games of the era it's inspired by. And even when those occasional weaker moments do show up, they last for so little that they don't really leave much of a negative impact on the experience. And this is all accompanied with wonderfully expressive pixel art for both Kaze and the goofy food-themed enemies she takes on, and absolutely gorgeous background artwork. And heck, I honestly undersold the soundtrack in my review. Sure, it doesn't reach those same heights that David Wise's work for DKC reached, which to be fair is an exceedingly high bar to get to, but Paulo Boru's compositions for the game are still great nevertheless. And yes, the soundtrack finally did get released online, so I've been able to enjoy these pieces even more than before. I understand that it may seem weird to be putting a game like this over other great games like Deltarune or Ratchet and Clank, but hey, I'm just being honest with you all. I absolutely loved Kaze and the Wild Masks, so much so that I did actually go through with buying the game again, this time in physical form on Switch. And the icing on the cake? As I found out after I made my review, Kaze and the Wild Masks has been a long-time dream project for two of the game's lead developers, Andre Shan and Daniel Romanenko, who first came up with the idea for Kaze back when they were kids in the 90s. And as someone who also got into game development from the childhood dream of making his own games one day, I'm beyond happy that these two managed to make their 30-year-old dream come true, and for it to turn out as fantastic as it did. Kaze and the Wild Masks is easily my favorite game of 2021, and I'm incredibly excited to see whatever comes next from Andre, Daniel, and their team at Pixel Hive. Well done, each and every one of you. 
And that marks the end of my first video of 2022. Gotta say, it does feel nice finally doing one of these types of videos for once. I've been wanting to do this kind of topic for a few years now, but never went through with it. But hey, now I have. Now I can't say I quite know yet what I've got in store for you all for the remainder of the year, but I guess we'll just have to wait and see all together, won't we? In any case, this has been Black Mage Benjamin, thank you all for watching, and until the next video, have a nice day everybody.